Thank you all for coming. I should uh, start by admitting a bit of cognitive dissonance right now. I do most of my philosophical work in snowy and often rainy upstate New York and escape to places like this to be on vacation. And so I'm having a hard time this morning as I walk through the sun, getting myself in the mindset of giving a presentation. Um, so what I want to talk to you about today is uh, a bit of research that I've been doing with a number of people I'll introduce you to at the end of the talk on the epistemology of peer disagreement, uh, talking to you a little bit about a couple of effects that we found, uh, suggesting uh, something about what we think this might mean for the epistemology of peer disagreement, uh, but wanting to sort of underscore the fact that this is all sort of tentative when it comes to the conclusions. Uh, and being interested in finding out from you what you think, especially the people who might be engaged in this literature, might think that some of the uh, philosophical upshots are of what I'm going to talk to you about today. Okay. Oh, yeah. So for people who saw this talk uh, two days ago, uh, I did promise that there would be something different in it for you, so I wanted to mention that we're now featuring graphs. Um, that's about the, as much difference as I could make, uh, given that the time allotted to me today is actually shorter than the time allotted to me two days ago. Um, okay, so let me start with something that I think is relatively uncontroversial. Um, it's always good to start a philosophical talk that way. Uh, we oftentimes disagree with one another. We hold positions that other people explicitly reject uh, and do so even when we're given the same evidence and argument as these other people. And this fact about us has become increasingly interesting to epistemologists who have focused on peer disagreement. So these are situations in which everyone has or is presumed to have uh, the same information available to them. They're thought to be equally competent at assessing that information. And these facts about the people are known to one another. And what has interested epistemologists is whether cases of peer disagreement uh, require us to adjust the confidence that we have in our own beliefs, uh, and in what ways. OK, so I want to give a very, very brief overview of the debate, um, very brief, uh, because I want to get to some of the results, uh, and we don't have very much time. And so I'm going to present two views that I take to be uh, kind of classical views now in this literature. And I'm going to present what I hope are neutral presentations of these views. Um, there's a lot of disagreement, like there is in any philosophical discussion, about the exact details of any specific philosophical position. Um, and so some of you may hold something in the neighborhood of these views and object to how I've characterized it. Nothing that goes forward is going to rest too much on, on, on this characterization. This is mostly for people who may be new to the discussion. So on the one hand, we have what's sometimes called the equal weight view. So according to this view, we should be moved by the fact that we disagree with one another, with our epistemic peers. And unless we have some independent reason to prefer our own beliefs, we can't continue to rationally believe something once we find out that an epistemic peer believes that that statement is false or believes some statement that we know to be inconsistent with uh, P. Um, the idea here is that disagreement prompts significant doxastic revision. OK, on the other side of this debate um, is something that we might call the steadfast view. And the nice thing about these two views is you kind of get one by negating the other. Um, so with the steadfast view, we need not be moved by the fact, significantly by the fact that we disagree. Uh, we can continue to believe that P despite the fact that we know that an epistemic peer believes that not P or believes something that's inconsistent with P. Um, and to, so, so disagreement does not necessarily prompt any sort of significant doxastic revision. Okay, so what is interesting to me is not specifically which of these two or whether either of these two normative views is correct, but has something to do with the way that people generally go about trying to defend one or the other of these views or prosecute one or the other of these views. And it involves something really familiar to the philosophers in this room, maybe less so to psychologists who are here, but it's something that we in philosophers call the method of cases, uh, where we design hypothetical cases and use what we or other people think about these cases as evidence that specific normative theories or, or maybe even descriptive theories are true or false and as reasons for believing as such. So let me just give you a quick example from the literature. This is sometimes called the mental math case. It's taken from David Christensen. Suppose that you and your friend go out to dinner. When it's time to pay the check, you agree to split the check evenly and to give a 20% tip. You do the math in your head and become highly confident that your shares are $43 each. Meanwhile, your friend does the math in her head and becomes highly confident that uh, your shares are $45 each. You and your friend have a long history of eating out together and dividing the check in your heads and know that you've been equally successful at making these kinds of calculations. 
Usually you agree, but when you disagree, you know that your friend is right as often as you are. Moreover, you're both feeling sharp tonight and thought that the calculation was pretty straightforward before learning that you disagreed about the shares. So before I go on, I should apologize. I'm not going to read all the slides to you. I know you guys can read. Um, but I kind of wanted to touch the details here because you have the classic hallmarks of cases of pure disagreement. Sort of artificially even introduced in this case are these kinds of hallmarks. So um, you're equally sharp. You think it's straightforward. You have this track record. This is something that we very rarely have with other people that we find ourselves disagreeing with. Uh, you know that this track record has left you, you know, equal when it comes to these kinds of calculations and so on. Now this kind of case is supposed to show us the merits of the equal weight view because it seems unreasonable in this kind of situation to continue to, to, to prefer our own calculation to the calculation of our epistemic peer. So let's compare this case with a slight variation. Um, most of the details remain the same, so really what we have to pay attention to is what I've marked off in red here. Rather than doing the math in your head, what you do is you do the calculation carefully on pencil and paper, checking your results with a calculator, and your friend does the same. And you still disagree. You still come to believe that you owe $43 a piece. Your friend still comes to believe that it's a $45 share. Um, and what are you supposed to do in this case? Well, in this case, we might see ourselves moving from, from being conciliatory to being a bit steadfast. We might think that it's less reasonable to be conciliatory in this case because of the careful way that we went about doing the calculation. And the fact that we continue to disagree might signal something else to us than the fact that we need to change our own belief or the confidence we have in our own belief. We might think, well, maybe my friend had a little bit more to drink than I thought that she did. Uh, maybe her calculator is malfunctioning in some way. She should use her iPhone instead of the calculator. Uh, maybe she's pulling my leg. So there might be some kind of insincere communication. Uh, you know, after, after having gone out to eat so many times, uh, we just decided to kind of play with each other on this one. So in this case, it might seem more natural uh, to remain steadfast. Okay, so as I mentioned, oh, as I mentioned, uh, what's going to happen as we go forward is not an evaluation uh, or really any sort of investigation as to which of these two positions is correct. Instead, what we want to focus on is the way that people typically, or something about the way that people typically go about thinking about these cases. Okay, so my lab is interested in looking at how we think about philosophical cases. And so in this case, what we decided to do was to try to find a representative sample of cases used in the epistemology of peer disagreement and to begin to look at some of the factors that might influence how ordinary people respond to these kinds of cases. So by way of trying to come up with a representative sample, what we did was we went through Jennifer Lackey's Oxford Bibliography of uh, the epistemology of disagreement. We went through each of the papers that was included in this bibliography and we just pulled out all the cases that were introduced or discussed in those papers. And this gave us a sample of 20 cases. Uh, we recruited uh, 2,000 subjects using Amazon MTurk. We assigned 100 participants to each of the cases. Uh, we made a further subdivision, uh, which I'll mention in just a moment. Uh, but this is sort of how we generally set up. Each person got one case and was asked a single question about the case together with certain uh, sort of standard demographic <coughs> questions. Okay, so the first thing that we were interested in seeing was just whether or not there was an overall preference for one of the two normative theories. So whether the folk generally prefer to be steadfast or, to, or prefer to be conciliatory when confronted with these kinds of cases of pure disagreement. And what we found, interestingly, that was that there was no significant preference in one direction or the other. So when we looked at all the cases together, um, everything's kind of around 50%. Um, so you don't see a significant preference beyond chance for either of those two normative positions that we just mentioned. But what's even more interesting is when you look at each individual case, you do see a significant preference, either for the equal weight view or for the steadfast view. Which means that philosophers are doing something um, to get people to have the intuitions that they want them to have. Oh, I should mention, not only does each case elicit a strong reaction either for the steadfast view or the equal weight view, it elicits exactly the kind of response that the philosopher in question wanted it to elicit. Now, I can pause here, we can all, you know, kind of take a congratulatory pat on the back and say, yeah, this is why I spent eight to 12 years in graduate school, was to learn how to construct cases that effectively get people to see what I want them to see. But for those of you who are familiar with early work in experimental philosophy, 
this should come on somewhat, this should be somewhat surprising because one of the things that we found in a lot of that early work was cases where philosophers were spectacularly bad at predicting how ordinary people were going to respond to the cases that they were using. So at least when it comes to the epistemology of disagreement, we have this going for us. We're doing a pretty good job of constructing cases, or at least getting people to see what we want to see from those cases. So the question becomes, how are we doing this? How are philosophers engaged in this debate, getting people to see what they want them to see? So we went back into the papers, and we looked at a variety of factors, two of which I'm going to talk about today. One is we looked at, at the, the questions that typically accompany these cases. So these cases aren't just presented and then moved on. The reader is usually invited to think about the case and then is sort of either asked explicitly what this case would, you know, like what their response is to this kind of case, or maybe the author suggests the kind of response that should be given. And so we were interested in what kind of question accompanied the case. And what we found were sort of two differences. Um, one set of differences had to do with whether or not the question was presented in a scalar fashion, so was it open-ended and gradient, or was it presented as a kind of forced choice question, you're given one option or the other, <coughs> remain steadfast, give equal weight considerations to your friend's opinion, or how much should you adjust the confidence in your own belief, where this could take any number of values. The other thing that we saw was that there was a difference in whether or not you were being asked just to think about your own belief as a result of this disagreement, or whether you were asked to make an explicit comparison between your belief and your friend's belief. And so we wanted to see whether or not these kinds of differences mattered, whether or not the endpoints would matter, so like what kind of question you're being asked, and whether or not how the question is being phrased as a forced choice or an open-ended question would matter. And what we find is that question type does matter. So we find that people are more likely to give um, steadfast responses when they're asked only to think about the confidence that they have in their own belief. And they're more likely to give equal weight responses when they're asked to make explicit comparative judgments about the relative value of their beliefs and their friends' beliefs. Um, and we find this whether we're looking at it in terms of like, you know, everything on a, on a dichotomous scale. And we also find it if we're looking at things on a continuous scale. So it seems that it's not the way the question is phrased as either a forced choice question or as a scalar question, but what you're being asked to do in the question that makes a difference. If you're being asked to make a comparative evaluation, you tend to be more um, conciliatory. If you're being asked to make a singular confidence evaluation, you tend to be more steadfast. Okay, the next thing that struck us about these cases is that they have a wide variety of topics and they're, you know, the, the cases are not uniform across all the different papers, as you'd expect them not to be. Um, and so what we decided to do was to look through the cases and see what features of the cases stood out to us, what features seemed salient to us. Um, where salience here was measured in terms of um, features that appear in some cases but not all cases. Uh, what we did was we went through individually, we um, wrote down which features were salient. So I did this with, with two collaborators. We figured out which ones were salient to us. We came up with lists longer than these five, but these five appeared on all of our lists. And so these are the ones that we decided to run with. You might find other salient features. I'd be interested in hearing about those. Uh, but these were the ones that we decided to uh, move forward with. So the first has to do with perspective. I put person here because perspective couldn't fit into the oval. Um, but basically, the idea has to do with using perspective, voice, person. Um, has to do with whether or not the vignette is written in the first, second, or third person. Uh, of the 20 vignettes that we had, there was only one that was written in the third person. So we're going to primarily focus on first person vignettes and second person vignettes. And so we wanted to see was whether or not um, being asked what you should do would affect your response, as opposed to being asked what someone else should do. And in particular, this often was being asked what the narrator should do. Um, so I should mention this because every time I look at these, these uh, two graphs, I panic that we're suddenly misinterpreting what's going on here. So first person has to do with the perspective of the narrator. Second person has to do with the perspective of the reader. So in the second person vignette, you're being asked what you would do uh, as the reader. In the first person vignette, the narrator is asking you, the reader, what they should do. Um, and so what we find is that people are more conciliatory when they're asked what they should do than they are when they're asked what someone else should do, and in particular, the narrator. 
Um, so it seems like we have different normative attitudes for ourselves than we do for other people. Oh, I should also mention, I didn't throw up uh, p-values. Unless I have mentioned otherwise, the p-values here are all below 0 0.001. Uh, and uh, the effect sizes are all medium to large. Um, okay, so we find this whether we're looking at a comparative evaluation, whoop, excuse me, or looking at a confidence evaluation. So here it doesn't matter what kind of question you're being asked uh, in response to peer disagreement. Person matters regardless of what kind of question you're being asked. Okay, so the second thing we looked at was affect. So unless you've had recent bad experiences going out to dinner and having a friendship, a long time friendship break up because you couldn't agree on your split of a bill. Uh, Christensen's case probably didn't uh, elicit any strong emotional response from you. But some of the cases that are used in this literature do um, elicit strong emotional responses. So uh, one case that stands out has to do with a disagreement about the moral responsibility of a serial pedophile. Um, and I have, you know, this is something that, that is, is, is going to draw out a, a whole host of strong emotional responses not drawn out in the mental math case. And so what we wanted to see was whether or not having a strong, typically negative emotional response to the kind of disagreement involved um, would impact uh, your response to that. And what we found again is that it does. And it does in both kind, like, with both kinds of questions, regardless of whether you're asked to make a confidence evaluation or a comparative evaluation. Oh, excuse me. Sorry, I'm using a new clicker today and the buttons are different than I'm used to. Okay, so um, in both cases, where you do have high affective valence, people are more steadfast. This is probably unsurprising. We're less likely to change our own views, the confidence we have in our own views. We're less likely to credit other people's views as being as, as valuable as our own when we have a whole lot of emotional investment in the disagreement than we are when we have less emotional investment in the disagreement. Okay, so the next thing we had to do had to do with uh, resolution. Again, this might be a little bit misleading. This has this is really prospects for resolving the disagreement. So some, uh, some of the vignettes that are used in this literature uh, present the disagreement um, as if there's a method or an instrument uh, that could be used to resolve the disagreement that hasn't been used so far by the two people who are disagreeing with one another. So the mental math case, again, is a good example here. So I think all of us, if we found ourselves in a situation where we had made the calculation in our heads, and found that we disagree with a friend, would just go and you know pull out our phones and do the calculation that way and hope that that would resolve the disagreement. So in some cases, uh, it's left open in the vignette that there may be some way of resolving the disagreement that hasn't been appealed to so far. Whereas in some cases, this is explicitly closed off. So the thought is all of the available evidence, maybe all possible evidence relevant to the, to, to the disagreement is on the table has been carefully evaluated by both parties and so on. So there's no way of going beyond what's already available to resolve this disagreement. And so that's what you're looking at here. Does it matter whether we think that there's something we could do that we haven't already done? Now what we end up getting is a slightly more complicated picture here, and the same kind of complication is gonna happen as we go forward, that we're now gonna be getting an interaction effect. What's going to happen is that we're going to get an interaction between the kind of question that you're being asked and these factors of the case. So in the first, you remember I said there's no, inter there's no interaction. It doesn't matter what kind of question you're being asked. It doesn't matter if you're being asked to make a comparative evaluation or a confidence evaluation. It now is going to matter whether you're being asked to give a comparative evaluation or a confidence evaluation. I'm collapsing everything onto one slide here. What we did was we just translated um, the scales that we were using all into um, a scalar uh, a scale. Okay, so what you find now is there's no significant difference in these kind of situations, um, or excuse me, actually there is a significant difference, but it's only at the P01 or uh, 0.01 uh, um, value, that you find that people are slightly more conciliatory when asked to make comparative evaluations, but they're also slightly more steadfast when asked to make confidence evaluations. So it seems like here, the prospects of, re of, of resolution, when you find yourself in a situation where it doesn't seem like there's any way to resolve the disagreement, people who are asked just to evaluate the confidence they have in their own beliefs 
that actually drives up the confidence they have in their own beliefs, knowing that there's no prospect. But when they're asked to make a comparative judgment, it does drive down their, the likelihood that they're going to prefer their own belief to that of an epistemic peer. We also looked at perceptions of objectivity. So some of the cases, or in some of the cases, the disagreement seems to be about matters of fact. In other cases, the disagreement seems to be about matters of judgment. And in some cases, we're kind of collapsing matters of judgment into cases where uh, it's explicitly mentioned that more than one response may be reasonable, given the evidence that's currently available to the two parties. So we were wondering whether or not thinking in terms of objectivity might influence how people respond to these kinds of cases. Oops. And again, we find that it depends on what kind of question you're being asked. Um, so here we actually have no um, significant difference when you're asked to make a comparative evaluation between cases where the disagreement is about a matter of fact or is about a matter of judgment. But you do find confidence evaluations change. And when it's a matter of judgment, disagreement drives up the confidence we have in our own beliefs. So if you're asked to evaluate the confidence you have in your own beliefs, again, the disagreement actually causes you to be more confident than you were before. In cases of judgment than in cases of fact. Okay. And then finally, we wanted to look at stakes. So there's been a lot of work recently about pragmatic encroachment in epistemology. Um, this usually has to do with uh, knowledge attribution, but we are wondering whether or not it has to do with, we, we might find similar things when it comes to uh, cases of how you should normatively respond to uh, peer disagreement. And so it depends on like what's at stake. So again, we might think of the mental math case. Not much is at stake. It's a $2 difference unless you're feeling particularly strapped. It probably doesn't matter which of the two of you is right. Um, but there are other cases that have to do with very high stakes matters. Um, so how much tensile strength is required in a bridge in order to uh, for, the, for that bridge to withstand certain kinds of vibrations caused by cars um, that are driving across it. A great deal matters that you get the answer to that question right. And so if you and an epistemic peer disagree about this, we might think this is a really high stakes case in comparison to the kind of case that Christensen is considering in the mental math case. And again, we find an interaction. So in this case, stakes does not seem to affect the confidence that you have in your own belief, which is interesting. So if you're asked to make an evaluation of how confident you are um, knowing that a peer disagrees with you, it doesn't seem relevant whether or not you're dealing with a low stakes case or a high stakes case. It's kind of disturbing, I guess. Um, but it does impact whether you're going to preference your own opinion. So people who are asked um, to compare the um, or, or to evaluate the comparative merits of their own belief and their friend's belief are less likely to remain steadfast to their own belief in, in high stakes cases than in low stakes cases. Okay, so what does this all mean? Well, for those of you who have a certain view of experimental philosophy and who don't know me particularly well, you might be expecting at this point that I'm going to flame out about um, what this means is that we shouldn't use the method of cases anymore, and you know, philosophers have been going out with the business of doing philosophy all wrong, and we now need to replace. Uh, the method of cases was something more scientific. Uh, but I'm not that kind of experimental philosopher. I don't know that any of us are that kind of experimental philosopher. Um, remember that what I said experimental philosophers are really interested in doing is just thinking about how people think about philosophical questions. And so what I want to suggest in the time that I have remaining, um, or just a portion of that time, because I really want to give you guys time to talk, um, is that I think it has something to do with the norms that we derive um, in response to uh, cases of peer disagreement. Um, and this is the really tentative part of the talk. Uh, I'm pretty confident of, with the results that we have so far, although I'd be interested in any questions people have or suggestions about ways that we might um, sort of confirm or uh, test differently what we are looking at. Um, but I think actually one of the upshots of this, now I have a particular view of what kind of normative implications can be and should be deriv or derived from descriptive claims about how people think. And that has to do with a probably idiosyncratic view about the nature of philosophical truth that's not shared by a lot of people in this room. Um, but I tend to think that when you find out that people think in a certain way, this should have a significant and profound impact on what kind of normative conclusions you want to draw in a given discipline or a different area of philosophy. So I think one thing that, that, that this suggests is the need for a rather fine-grained normative account of peer disagreement. 
Um, one that takes into account uh, differences between evaluations of confidence and evaluations of comparative status. Um, now this is a tricky one, and I imagine some of you have, have picked up on a potential problem with this, but I'm going to leave that for Q&A. If you guys want me to point it out, um, I will, but I think it, it seems that most, most times I give this talk, people have picked up on it, so um, I'll let you guys ask about that. Um, the second thing is I think that uh, we need a normative theory that takes into account the content of the disagreement and owns up to the idea that we're not going to get a one-size-fits-all theory of peer disagreement. Instead, what we're going to have um, or, or need is an account of peer disagreement that allows it to be the case that what's reasonable in certain cases of peer disagreement may be unreasonable uh, when matters of the disagreement itself change. Okay. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about this morning. I want to thank, oh man, everybody got pixelated this time. Last time it was just Chad um, about, um, so anyways, this is Diana Betts. She's a colleague of mine in psychology at uh, Siena College. This is John Waterman, who teaches at Colby College. Um, Chad Gonerman, who teaches at the University of Southern Indiana. And Andrew Higgins, who's at uh, the University of Illinois, graduate student at the University of Illinois. Uh, we'd like to thank the Templeton Foundation and the Thrive Center. Um, and also the Center for Philosophy of Science at the University of Pittsburgh for support. Thank you. Okay, now we're in the queue. I'm going to have to cut it off promptly, 11.20, so I apologize in advance for that. And uh, Stephen Sitch, why don't you start, and we'll uh, keep your hands up until I get your name down. <coughs> Joshua, I, I may be the person in the room who uh, advocates the official picture. Uh, Would you like me to put it back up while you no, no, okay. no. <laughs> uh, But I was curious about the demography of your sample. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're using MTurk, I assume if you're using standing MTurk or other participants. Yes. And you're trying to go from those results to a nuanced and interesting, sophisticated normative theory. Uh, so I've really got two kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one is, did you do any demographic analysis of the uh, gather demographic data on your participants, and uh, are there interesting demographic differences between men and women, old people, young people, and so on, uh, and what that would say about uh, your move from the descriptive to the normative. Mm -hmm. uh, the second uh, is uh, uh, something that still remains to be determined, namely, if you did it in a very different subject population uh, and got very different results, uh, how would you <clears throat> combine that into uh, your normative account? Yeah, okay, so thank you. So um, we did collect demographic information. So we collected information about gender, uh, um, ethnic uh, background, uh, educational level, uh, political orientation, um, age, and um, yeah, I think that might have been it. Uh, we found uh, slight interactions between gender and um, also between age. So people who were older were slightly more likely to be steadfast across cases, and women were more likely were, were slightly more likely to be uh, conciliatory across cases. But when you look at these interacting with the other uh, variables, it kind of washes out, and it's not very interesting. Um, in terms of looking at it cross culturally, with kind of where I took the second part of the question leading. This is actually something that we're interested in investigating and we're in the process of beginning to translate the cases. So you have to do two things. One is you have to just find a good translation and a good population. But the other is you have to make sure that when you translate the cases that they still remain ecologically valid. Um, so some of the cases are just involving things that, certain, that just don't resonate for certain populations. Um, so we do have, and we, which we've been using for, for other studies, um, in my lab, uh, we do have access to Chinese subjects and we also have access to um, uh, Indian subjects and so we're in the process of getting these translated um, and hopefully in the next couple of months we'll have some results that we can talk about. Now if it turns out that uh, we do find that there's a significant cross-cultural difference in how groups of people respond to these kinds of cases, um, I think you're right, that's not going to fit as nicely into the a uh, new positive picture that I'm trying to uh, draw here. Um, I should also mention, we, I didn't talk about today, but I talked about a couple of days ago. We have some results involving other kinds of personal difference or individual differences. 
And so we looked at things like the interaction between different kinds of personality dispositions, like need for cognition, need for cognitive closure, perspective taking, political orientation, as I mentioned. We do find that there are that those do influence how people respond to the cases. That doesn't fit as nicely into this picture because then you do have a significant worry about the tracking of maybe irrelevant features. Um. Uh, okay. um, I kind of like your conclusion, but what I wonder about is why we should care about what people think. I mean, we're doing epistemology, because we're doing logic, and it turns out that lots of people violate a logical principle, you, you wouldn't say, well, you know, let's, let's revise our logic. You'd say, a lot of people make logical mistakes. And so, uh, you know, if we want to know what you should think about peer disagreement, what's the relevance of the data of what um, ordinary folk think about this? Because it could very well be that ordinary folk are not particularly good at it in exactly the same way as ordinary folk aren't all that great at most poems. Not just ordinary folk when it comes to modus tollens. Yeah, yeah. uh, <laughs> um, okay, so I, I want to set aside the potential disanalogy between uh, looking at what ordinary people think about philosophical cases and looking at what ordinary people think about sort of cases involving the rules of mathematical logic. Um, although I might be willing to go relativist if we found stable cultural group differences in um, <clears throat> which inferences we deem to be logically correct and which inferences we deem to be logically incorrect. I'm not certain, but I'm kind of a formalist about these kinds of things and think that there is no like, one logic um, that we could appeal to as the correct um, guidebook for which inferences are good and which inferences are bad. Uh, but I want to set that aside because logicians don't engage in the method of cases when presenting uh, arguments for their results in the same way. So I think what makes these kinds of, you know, what, what makes what people think relevant in the epistemology of disagreement is the way that many of us go about the business of doing the epistemology of disagreement, which is to construct hypothetical cases and to use judgments about those cases as uh, offering some kind of evidence or rhetorical flourish um, or you know, persuasive device, however it's being used, it's introducing our, our opinions about these cases into the, the, the discussion. Okay, but the problem is we offer these cases to other philosophers. We don't put them in the New York <coughs> Times or something. So asking, if you did this study with other philosophers, then there, you know, I can see that, yes, this is exactly on target. Mm -hmm. But if it turns out that a bunch of people who don't necessarily go in for this sort of thing are people were experimenting on it, might simply be that, you know, this, these are not the people you're offering the cases to. Sure. So I think, I mean, it's an open empirical question as to whether or not philosophers are going to um, be sensitive to the same kinds of things in their judgments about these cases that ordinary M. Turkers are. Um, and so in the great spirit of experimental philosophy, I would just say, Let's just, we, we need to do this, we need to study philosophers, and um, I you know, certainly plan on doing that, and um, we'll hopefully be able to talk about those results sooner than later. Uh, but I should mention that in many cases where um, we appeal to philosophers' um, expertise in these matters, what we end up finding in the limited number of studies that have been done on philosophers, because uh, there's special considerations about giving philosophers cases. One thing is that philosophers are oftentimes familiar with these cases. Um, and so you have a hard time getting fresh perspectives on these cases. So um, there are certain kinds of cases that I didn't just know the stock answer to because I went to graduate school in philosophy. Um, if you ask me the case and I quickly recognize that it's that kind of case, I'm just going to give you the stock answer. Uh, it's not necessarily indicative of what I think about the case or what I even you know, my first initial reaction was to the case. So we may not be getting the right kinds of judgments. But setting those things aside, when we do actually study philosophers, um, the limited number of, of, of studies that have been conducted find that philosophers are sensitive to roughly the same kinds of things that ordinary people are sensitive to when they make judgments about the cases. So um, I think that it's a good place to start. The last thing I'd mention, since I'm going on a little bit long here, is that I tend not to think that the only people whose judgments are relevant in this kind of situation are philosophers. No, but why? 
Why? Because everyone is interested in disagreement. Disagreement is an issue that we have in a whole host of contexts outside of the philosophical classroom, outside of philosophical journals. And I think that unless our views about disagreement accord with the kinds of views that we have as ordinary intelligent creatures who are trying to navigate interpersonal relationships and construct social, you know, social and political organizations, I think we have to be interested in what those people think, and I think if we find stable differences in what people think, or you know, where the differences are responding to different features, we should take that into consideration when, we're, when we, as normative theorists, step back from that environment and think about what we should be doing and what they should be doing. We, need to th we just need to know what they're responding to. So, I have a quick question about the affect mm -hmm. module. Uh, if I understood right, you're tracking sort of High affect versus low affect. Yes. Do you do any difference between positive and negative? We haven't so far. Yeah. Difference in some of the other domains. Yeah. So so I think you know. I should mention, I don't know if I mentioned when I was introducing, this is an exploratory study. Um, it, that probably came across in the way that I like mentioned how we sort of began and how the study unfolded. So obviously we need to back all, like everything up that we've shown so far, which is experimental manipulation and you know, that kind of stuff. But I think that you're right. So what we were doing is we were limited by the cases that we decided to use as part of our sample. Those cases involved negative affect when they involved any affect. Um, so I think your suggestion is fantastic and is something we certainly are going to have to consider going forward is to manipulate positive and negative affect um, and also um, you know, try to, you know, grades of affect as well. But all the cases that didn't involve high affect or negative? Yes. That's interesting how we can instruct our patients. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to ask about the confidence versus the comparative mm -hmm. uh, difference. Um, I guess this may be in support of your So, so the worry that I've had expressed to me about this, and I'm, I'm, I have to admit, terrible at probability, um, is that, so, you know, the cases are supposed to be cases where you and your friend become highly confident. So we might think, you know, what does this mean if we were to convert it to, you know, prob you know to actual numerical probabilities? You know, something like, you know, 0.9 or higher or something um, is the credence that you assign to this. So now, if you're going to remain as confident as before, but now also you want, like, hold your friend's position, which is logically inconsistent with yours, to also be as high. You have to bring them up to 0.9. It doesn't seem possible, because it seems like if you assign 0.9 to P, you have to assign 0.1 right. to it's not P. Uh, no, absolutely, absolutely. So, so I think that the initial worry that people have, now, these are, these are between subjects designed, so it's never the case that someone is explicitly being asked to evaluate the confidence they have in their own belief and then being asked to make a comparative judgment or you know, uh, counterbalancing as, as, as you'd want. Um, but it does seem to be possible, given what we find here, that you would have, if we asked people to make both kinds of judgments, you would have this weird situation in which they're like, I'm just as confident as I was before that I'm right, but I'm now no longer more confident that I'm right than that you're right, which does, I think, for a lot of people, seem like that, like those two positions are sort of rationally consistent yeah. with one another. I was thinking confidence. <laughs> confidence sounds different to me than probability that I'm right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, 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 and a lot of this, and again, like I'm not an epistemologist, so I know that there's like subtleties about what it means to assign confidence to a belief, and you know, so there, there may be ways of, of making this unproblematic. 
to be different than somebody else who can use token as a comparison. So is that what you're suggesting? Or, and then second, if that is what you're suggesting, <coughs> you might make sense of it in the following way. Um, it might make sense to have a different norm depending on how many points of view are issued because when only your own point of view is the focus of your attention, maybe the sphere of the evidence that you're considering is more limited, whereas if you're considering the other person's point of view, comparison with yours, maybe that adds a different kind of evidence to what you're actually looking into at the moment. Yeah. So, so, so first of all, was that your report you were suggesting? Second of all, is that a way that you might go to explain? Okay, so the first thing is what I was suggesting was more in line with what Neil was, I, I, th I think, getting at with his question, which is that it seems like if we have these two things, we're asking, you know, how much confidence do you have in your own belief versus, you know, whether or not you want to privilege your own belief over the belief of a friend. We sometimes, it, it seems like in the literature, these are sometimes taken as asking equivalent questions. And since we find that people differ with regard to how they respond to peer disagreement, depending on what kind of question they're being asked, my suggestion was just that it's up to the epistemologists involved in this debate to sort of wrestle with that fact. One way of doing it might be to figure out some other way of understanding confidence that doesn't make it the case that you run into this logical, basic logical problem with probability that you can't have probability more than one for any two, you know, for any um, p and not p, or p or not p. Um, what, what your suggestion was, though, I think is equally fascinating, which is this idea that what you're being asked to do there changes the total evidence that you're considering psychologically at any given moment. Um, and I think that's a terrific suggestion and possibility and one that we would just have to begin to find a way to experimentally manipulate and test to see if that's what's going on. Um, and uh, so yeah, 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 thank you. Yeah, so um, uh, one point I wasn't clear on was, was earlier. Perspective of the person, mm -hmm. and uh, whether it was first sight or first sight, it, it felt to me like <coughs> surely there there was something uh, weird. And uh, but and I, so I was wondering, did you have any uh, hypotheses about the, the kinds of cognitive processes that would respond? Um, yeah, I, I share your view that there's something probably weird going on there, um, I, which also might, you know, th raise some flags about the positive, you know, maybe this does suggest that there's something worrisome about the way we go about doing this. Um, the, I guess my, my pet hypothesis right now is that there's something involved in the way that the subject wants to appear to the, uh, to us. Um, and this is that subjects want to appear to be a bit more conciliatory than they otherwise might be. Um, so you might think that what's happening is that people are suggesting that when they're being asked what they would do, that, they're, that they say they're going to be conciliatory. Uh, but when they're asked what, or, or what they should do, but when they're asked what other people should do, um, they're, they're more steadfast. And we might think, well, maybe what's going on is when we ask them what someone else would do, we're getting the... Uh, more accurate depiction of their normative views than when we're asking them what they would do, in which case you're getting this performance uh, variable. Um, so on that same note, I wanted to know, in your MSERC study, was it just the U.S. population or anybody who could speak English? Uh, we restricted this to U.S. population. So do you think that it's because of the political climate that we currently have, where we have very a lot of controversial topics, and people are more resistant to saying exactly how they feel because they don't want to infringe on somebody else's belief that affected the first person, second person storyline. It's an interesting question. It, it hadn't occurred to me that, that um, something about the American, something, something about US culture uh, would necessarily be influencing this. But of course, that's kind of in the background of one of the reasons why we wanted to do cross-cultural studies as well. Um, but one of the interesting things that, that, that I, I take from your suggestion um, is that we might extend the MTurk population. So our, our way of doing the cross-cultural studies has been to translate um, into uh, uh, Mandarin and to use uh, Zhubaji uh, 
basically the Chinese version of MTurk, um, and try to come up with ecologically valid correlates to the cases that we're using here, and then translate into Hindi and give it to um, Indian subjects. Um, but we could also just sort of turn off the restriction to US subjects in MTurk, um, and see if tracking nationality um, might change the difference even amongst English and native English speakers. So maybe we'd find that Canadians have far different responses to these kinds of questions than do Americans or something. It's a good suggestion. We're out of time, so.